What is going on YouTube? I am Lamont at large today. I am at the Glenwood Cemetery here in Houston, Texas. Uh, the beautiful backdrop of downtown Houston skyline. Nice looking cemetery if I do say so myself. The last time I was here, I didn't do a video. I just wanted to walk around and it was hot. It's all get out today, a lot cooler. The weather is a lot more milder for my personal taste. Anyways, today we're going to take a tour around this cemetery. Uh, we're going to see some graves, some famous, some not so famous. We're going to talk about uh, some of the lives of these people here, show you the scenery of this cemetery. One of the nicest, most well-kept cemeteries that I've been to uh, in the entire country. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. Captain Little Harrison, Battery 119th Field Artillery, 32nd Division, American Expeditionary Forces, born in Columbus, Texas, September 16th, 1887, died in Alsace-Lorraine, July 14th, 1918, beloved son of Dr. and Mrs. R.H. Harrison. I'm imagining, of course, World War I, uh, he died in Alsace-Lorraine which uh, at the time part of uh which would be france a uh, little bit of history about that section of the world uh, originally it was controlled by france and then during the uh franco uh german slash prussian war if you will um they seized control of that part of the world so it, it basically remained part of the german empire if you will for the next 50 years and then after world war one ended uh the treaty after germany lost was that they succeed control of um, alsace lorraine back into uh france's hands that part of uh what's what you would call france actually you know because it's kind of bordered uh with uh you know next to not bordered but it's, it's just it's next to and I don't have the map in my head, but I know like Luxembourg and Berlin, they're around that area. And most people back then, uh, I want to say 90% of the people, or if not 90, most of them spoke German. Now, all because, you know, they were, uh, you know, they spoke German. <laughs> that didn't necessarily mean that they wanted to be Germans. So their culture was Germany based, but after the war, uh, France got control of it. Uh, now it's named Alsace Moselle, I believe. And uh, I don't know in, in that region if people still mostly speak German or not. It could be a, a dual language um, part of France. I'm not really sure. Uh, but I'd like to know why he was named Little. I can only imagine that maybe he was born, he was a little kid. But anyways, thank you for your service, sir one of the millions of young men going out to a foreign land and uh, never coming home ever again except in a box She sings and walks with the angels in the city of God. Mary Eleanor Phelps, she died from second and third degree burns in an explosion at her job. I don't know what she did for a living and I don't know what the cause of the explosion was. Uh, very, very sad case here of somebody dying way, way, way too young. Currently, we are walking up to the Cullinan family plot here at the Glenwood Cemetery, and one of the people buried at that plot is one Joseph Cullinan, who was born in Sharon, Pennsylvania in 1860. Sharon is that little pocket of Pennsylvania that borders uh, West Virginia and Ohio, a lot of oil in that area, and he got a job in the oil fields 
over in Sharon, Pennsylvania. This guy basically just worked his way up from nothing uh, into being a very, very successful uh, oil tycoon, if you will. Uh, he founded the Texas company, which later went on to be turned into Texaco, so you might have filled up at one of their gas stations. There's not as many Texacos around now as there was when I was a little kid. Uh, but this guy, later on when he moved to Texas, uh, he got a job managing some uh, oil uh, refineries or drilling sites, something like that. And he built his own refinery. And from that, uh, he moved down to Houston and with the whole oil uh, boom, this guy made himself uh, very, very wealthy. And he was also quite the philanthropist too. I believe this is his wife right here. And uh, he died of pneumonia. I want to say he died in California. So uh, yeah, he was a philanthropist. Uh, uh, definitely did spread the wealth of, uh, of his vast fortune. And uh, this is the man right here who founded Texaco. The next grave we're gonna go visit is that of one Howard Hughes. Uh, what can you say about good old Howard Hughes? Uh, probably the richest, most craziest person I've ever read about in my life. I've never seen the movie The Aviator, but it's based off of his life. Uh, Howard Hughes was born in December 24th of 1905 here in Houston, Texas. Now, a lot of people might not know exactly uh, how Howard Hughes got his start, how he became so immensely wealthy. So Howard, his father was an inventor. His father's name was Howard Hughes Sr. And Howard Hughes Sr was a pretty rich man himself. Uh, he was an inventor and he owned Howard Hughes Tool Company. So how he made his money, quite a clever guy, is back in the early 1900s when there was a huge oil boom here in Houston, Texas, when we were digging for oil, back then the drill bits that we used uh, could only drill uh, through such uh, material as rock at a certain speed and there was rock that was very very hard that the drill bits that were known to man back then were unable to penetrate that uh, very very hard rock so he invented a drill bit that was capable of drilling into the ground at 10 times the speed of anybody else's drill bit and also there was, again, that very, very hard rock that no drill bits could even drill through, but his could. So he would patent his invention and he would uh, license his drill bits out to companies uh, who uh, wanted to use it to explore the drill for oil. And that lone invention uh, made Howard Hughes Sr. a very, very wealthy man. And I don't know if Howard Hughes Sr. knew that when he had his kid and he named him after him, that uh, his own child would exceed his own genius. Little Howard Hughes Jr. was credited with, at the age of 11, of building the very first wireless FM transmitter. And when he was 12 years old, his mother wouldn't let him own a motorcycle. Uh, his mother was, I guess you would say she was mentally ill, very OCD, and that's probably where uh, later on in life, Howard Hughes would get his mental illness directly from his mother. So Howard told his mom, hey, I want a motorcycle. I'm rich or we're rich. And she said, no, it's dangerous. You're insane. Well, you know, she was right. He was insane. And so he said, ah, uh, screw it. I'm going to build my own. So he made the first, uh, at least in Houston, the very first motorized bicycle. And he made, uh, made it in the newspaper. So growing up as a millionaire's kid in Houston, uh, 
You would think that he would be lazy and would just want to live off of his parents' fortune and just kind of do whatever you want. You got an easy life. You can go to school. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But uh, I will give it to uh, Howard Hughes. Uh, he definitely had gumption when it comes to uh, basically blazing his own trail. Uh, his mother and father, they both died within two years of each other. And I believe by the time Howard Hughes was 19 or 20 years old, uh, he had taken over the family business if you will so in the in the will uh he was left with about a million dollars and control of howard hughes tool company wow so you're you're 19 20 years old and you're a millionaire that is absolutely amazing now he wanted to continue in on the family business but he had a passion uh, growing up as a kid and later it, it you know became true I, he wanted to make movies he wanted to go to hollywood and become this uh film producer and that's exactly what he did so he dropped out of high school and at the age of 19 before his father died i believe uh, he was attending rice university uh, he would later go on to marry a woman I believe her name was Ella Rice. She was the great grandniece of the founder of that school. I hope I'm right in that. So he convinces her, let's move out to Hollywood. I'm very rich. We all know that. Uh, I want to make movies. So the interesting life of Howard Hughes would begin then and there. So this guy, uh, he makes his first movie. It's called Swell Hoken. And uh, the movie was so terrible <laughs> that it didn't get released uh, into theaters. Okay, back to the drawing board. And Howard Hughes, being ever so the perfectionist that he was, would oftentimes lock himself away for... There's a number that says 20 days. Uh, he always, if there was a problem, if he were just kind of uh, thinking about life's problems or issues or just if he really needed to think... It was that magic number of 20 days where he would kind of lock himself away in his room and just kind of think. So he did that, got over his first failure, and later he would uh, go on to make his next movie, uh, which was uh, called uh, Two Arabian Mads. Uh, that ended up uh, winning uh, some Academy Award or an Oscar, something along those lines. Uh, it starred William Boyd and uh, Mary Astor. So that movie was a uh, success. So his next movie that he would make was called Hell's Angels. I want to say it was about a, it was based off of a, a British pilot uh, during, you know, uh, the World War uh, fighting against the Germans or what have you. Now this, I guess you would call uh, this movie uh, back in those days would be known as a blockbuster, uh, had a uh, a big budget, which I'm sure he went over uh, quite a bit. So this guy hired over 70 uh, pilots and stunt pilots to do some of the uh, aircraft scene in the movie. Now, there was one scene where I guess the plane was supposed to spin into some kind of a death spiral, something like that, right? And so he was instructing the pilots, okay, this is what I want you know this to do because i gotta get this one shot and nobody wanted to do it just because it was friggin dangerous now by this time uh howard hughes was already a very accomplished pilot uh, he had started uh uh hughes uh, aviation corporation or w whichever name it was called and he was manufacturing airplanes which is how he made uh, a vast amount of his wealth and him being an accomplished pilot he says, screw you guys, I'm gonna do it. So this guy gets the scene, except for he crashed and he got hurt very, very badly. He actually suffered a pretty bad skull fracture, almost killed him. And from that accident, uh, he would develop a uh, hearing loss for the rest of his life. And who knows if possibly that uh, accident exacerbated his mental illness, I don't know, but he got hurt very, very very badly so later on 
Uh, after that's wrapped up, uh, he would make some more movies. Some did good, some didn't. Uh, he would go on later to own RKO uh, uh, Films, which was one of like the, the top five Hollywood film uh, companies in Hollywood. And later RKO, they went out of business in 1957. So what do you do when you're Howard Hughes and your mental illness is getting worse? Uh, he, he's being more reclusive. Uh, it was very weird to work for uh, Howard Hughes. He had this weird rule. You weren't allowed to look at him. No, nah, no, nah, if, 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 if you would be fired if you dare so much as looked at him. You were not allowed to speak to him unless you were spoken to. Yeah, this guy is uh, crazy uh, beyond belief. By the way, during that uh, movie, The Hell's Angels, I want to say at least four people died during uh, the making of the movie, and a couple of them died under uh, mysterious circumstances. So, yeah, that that movie was, uh, I don't know, I guess, I guess you would say bad juju uh, underneath it all. I have no idea. So, in... July the 11th, 1936, many of you, some of you may not know this, but uh, Howard Hughes was arrested in Los Angeles and booked for negligent homicide. So this guy, Gabriel S. Meyer, was crossing the street uh, down on 3rd and Lorraine. Uh, I want to say that could be, I would guess, I don't know if that's, I've never heard of Lorraine. I know where 3rd Street is. 3rd Street runs uh, from downtown out to... Uh, at least of uh, the Beverly Center. So I don't know if that was close to downtown, but he was standing uh, on the sidewalk and Howard Hughes was, you know, by witness accounts, was driving very erratically and crashed right into him and killed him. Now this guy's booked uh, for negligent homicide. And one of the cops in his police report, he was like, oh, this guy's sober. <laughs> but the doctor, at the hospital uh, that was looking over at uh, Howard Hughes was like, this guy's drunk. But I, I think that's when a, uh, a big bundle of $100 bills accidentally fell out of Howard Hughes' pocket and a doctor picked it up or somebody picked it up and they're like, oh, wait, no, he's so totally sober. Kind of one of those things and the charges uh, later on would be dropped. So we might go out to Los Angeles and go visit the grave of that uh, young man uh, later on when I get back to Los Angeles uh, later on this year So did Howard Hughes get away with murder? Well, not murder, but got away with something So moving in from the 50s going into the 60s Mental illness getting a, a lot more weird uh, Some say that he suffered from a disease called I think it's Oladenia that's the best I could pronounce it. I'm probably mispronouncing it. But basically, uh, that's a, a disease where a, a normal touch, like let's say somebody strokes your arm, to him that would be pain. And the reason why people feel that he had this was because oftentimes as he was getting older, he would just be held up in whatever place he was living at completely nude. He would only have like a small towel or like like a like a rag or something covering his genitals. He never liked to wear clothes. I don't know if it's in his head. I have absolutely no idea that uh, this guy. I'm telling you, like, just you know, bat s crazy. I guess is what you can say. So later he moves to Las Vegas, and by this time, I think by this time now he had owned or actually owned most of TWA, which is a an airline company. Now, there was uh, something to do with some some trouble. Something happened legally, where I, I want to say Howard Hughes was forced to sell his his stake in the company. So he sells all his shares. That's worth about five hundred million dollars. And so you have. Uh, you know, his aeronautics company, you have uh, his company, he has like a medical institute. 
you have uh, his hands are in a lot of um, cookie jars, if you will, when it comes to just making money. So this guy by now is probably, you know, worth well over a billion dollars. So he moves to Las Vegas. Now, at this time, going into the 60s, this guy really didn't live in a house. He would just rent hotels all over the world. He'd go down to Mexico, or Acapulco, what, whatever he wanted to do, and he would just live there. So he was going from hotel to hotel in Las Vegas. Now, you know, this guy's crazy. Yeah, he's paying a lot of money. This guy's renting the penthouse at the Desert Inn. And, you know, I don't know if the law back then, but I, I do know that from the time that I lived in Las Vegas, you're only allowed to rent a room for 30 days before you have to go to another room. So I'm guessing he would rent a room for the 30 days and he'd have to like go to another penthouse. And I guess he got tired of it because he says, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to buy it. So he ends up buying the Desert Inn and... After he buys that, uh, he ends up buying the Castaways. By the way, I lost about 50 bucks there at the Castaways back when I was about 22 years old. I'm still a little bit sore about that. He bought the New Frontier. He bought the Landmark, which, you know, is no longer there. And the Sands Hotel, which would later go on be demolished. And it is now the Venetian. So now this guy... And, you know, he doesn't have a lot of interactions with people. This guy is kind of doing his own thing. Uh, later on, towards the end of his life, uh, he didn't look anything at all the way he did when he was younger. He had stopped uh, grooming himself. Uh, he had stopped eating. Um, it said that he was doing a lot of drugs. Uh, slamming codeine or whatever kind of drugs he was doing he was definitely doing stuff and very very few people had any kind of interactions with him at all whatsoever i also forgot to mention that when howard hughes was young uh, he broke a couple uh, world records uh, when it comes to aviation uh, he broke the uh, i believe the airspeed of travel by plane at 352 miles an hour uh, he had this plane that he was mass producing that uh, you know him making more money uh, he had been contracted by the u.s government to make these planes uh, during world war ii but i want to say none of the planes uh, ever made it to fight in world war ii because there was constant problems with uh, getting the planes out uh, he had broke the record for flight time around the world uh, he did it in uh, right around 91 hours so this guy uh, as crazy as he was, uh, definitely was uh, instrumental in uh, developing our, uh, our, our, you know, just developing airplanes for commercial use and also um, for defense of this country. And there's also that weird thing about the Spruce Goose. I still, you know, I, I might have to just read it on my own, just out of my own enjoyment. Uh, the only thing I know about the Spruce Goose it was a uh, this huge plane that was designed to hold 750 people and it never made it to production i don't know what the i don't know why you would want to build a plane that takes off and lands in the water that holds 750 people see that's what kind of lunacy this guy i mean a genius mind but just cuckoo for cocoa puffs uh the spruce goose i don't know how many years it took to make and i don't know i'd love to know i gotta look this up later on i'd love to know how much it cost him to make but the spruce goose had this huge uh anticipation of how it was going to uh change uh how 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 we fly or how we traveled or whatever and again i don't get the landing on the water I, I i don't i don't i don't i don't know what he i don't know where his mind was with that but uh it finally flew <laughs> it flew a mile uh i i, I want to say that you could go see the spruce goose um i remember as a kid it being in california somewhere i don't know uh, next to the queen mary maybe catalina island don't don't hold it to me 
Uh, but uh, right in front of me right there, that is the grave of Howard Hughes. Let's go check it out. That is the Howard Hughes gravesite right there. He's buried alongside of his mother and his father. And as you can see, there is a fence around it, so you can't actually walk up to it. Now, I didn't want to get in trouble by climbing over the gate, so just kind of flew my drone over it a little bit so you can kind of see uh, Howard Hughes's name on this gravesite right here as we're looking at it. And uh, Howard Hughes, uh, he died uh, on the way from uh, Acapulco to Houston uh, aboard a plane because he was really, really sick. And by this time, uh, Howard Hughes was so uh, emaciated, uh, he was six foot four, but the autopsy report says he weighed 90 pounds and he was in just terrible, terrible, terrible shape. Uh, it says that he died of uh, uh, kidney failure. It was probably from all the drugs he was doing. And uh, they had notices, they, excuse me, they noticed several uh, broken syringes in his arm. So, I don't know, probably one of those guys that's so, so rich and famous and wealthy that uh, whatever he wants, he gets. And uh, there you go. Uh, quite a, quite an amazing, crazy, but amazing man. Uh, one Howard Hughes, right there. Hmm. I seen this uh, as I was uh, driving. I just want to show you this really quickly. Uh, this was a very cool sculpture. So I just wanted to come up here and uh, get a closer, uh, closer look at it. Oh, and you get a get an up top view of uh, of the uh, Hughes family grave. Manuel Ortiz Jr., April 4th, 1923 to October 10th, 1950. Online, his uh, death certificate states that he died October 10th, 1949, not 1950. So there's a discrepancy either there or on this stone. I'm not sure. Uh, he was not married at the time, and he was a clothing salesman here in Houston. He died of tuberculosis. Martha Welsh Peterson, a native of Beaumont. Martha graduated from Lamar College, then moved to Houston to work for Humble Oil and the law firm of Andrews Kurth. Her passion for Houston's history led Martha to become a dedicated volunteer with Greater Houston Preservations Alliance and later brought her here to Glenwood, where as project director for the Cemetery Foundation, she guided monument restoration, recorded the cemetery's past, and helped secure its future. Martha's research was an invaluable contribution to Houston's Silent Garden, the first published history of Glenwood. She is at rest in the cemetery that she loved. Definitely have to get a close-up of this. What are you doing, little lizard, right there? Check out that cat scratching the cross. Thought that was uh, so awesome. Right now we are really testing out this microphone. It is quite windy here. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, 
right here is the grave of Jean Tierney, uh, a very famous Hollywood actress. She would probably be in my top 10 of most beautiful actresses of all time. Uh, she's probably most known for her movie, Laura. I think the movie was about, uh, I think my sister might have watched it when I was a kid. She was always watching those old Hollywood movies and I was begging for her to turn the cartoons on and she would hush me. But uh, I think that movie was about a woman that was murdered and she, everyone thought she was dead and she came back, something like that. Um, she was also in The Razor's Edge in uh, 1943's Heaven Can Wait. And uh, her grave is right over here with the flowers, yes. Uh, a gorgeous woman and uh, she grew up uh, over on the East Coast her father was in the insurance business and I'm pretty sure he always heard you know how beautiful his daughter was and the family had a little bit of money she went overseas and uh, went to school I believe somewhere in France or something like that where she learned to speak the language and later she came back she had went to visit uh, with some you know friends or family out in the West Coast and they were trying to sign her, uh, I believe, to Warner Brothers, and her family was like, no, they did not want her to be an actress. And, uh, you know, when you're that pretty and good-looking, yeah, that's what you're going to do. And uh, later she was working on Broadway, and uh, one of the moguls at the time uh, in Hollywood, his name was Daryl Zanuck. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. You know, discovered her, quote-unquote and signed her to uh, 20th century and uh, she did quite a quite a few movies not too many because unfortunately she suffered from uh, uh, these uh, bouts of uh, depression that almost killed her uh, she had to be talked off of a ledge of a, a building uh, just because of how debilitating it was and it got to the point where she couldn't even uh, do movies and she had to leave for a while and then in an interview, she was talking about the electro shock therapy that she went through. You know, back in those days, when you had um, mental problems, <laughs> the doctor was like, electrocution therapy, that's what you need. And they would just shock you, literally just shock you. And they thought that that would cure it. I don't know if it ever worked at all on anybody. And uh, she later came back. Uh, I believe in the 70s to do a, a movie or two and uh, her last uh, project or anything that she ever did was a 1980 TV miniseries called Scruples uh, and that was it and uh, she sadly died uh, a few weeks before she was to turn 71 years of age she died of emphysema uh, she picked up smoking uh, because she wanted her voice to be more like like more womanly like more husky and uh, that life long habit uh, is what ultimately killed her and uh, she is buried uh, i believe that's her husband right there william howard lee yeah that's him right there uh big time oil money guy right here this guy was very 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 wealthy and uh, that is him right there um should have been a bigger actress than she was just mental illness derailed her career but um oh gorgeous oh, one of the ladies in the office um and i love talking to people uh she used to watch you know gene tierney as a little girl she said that you know because a lot of pictures of her are in black and white uh and you know she would read the magazines of you know when she was a little girl of all the hollywood actors and actresses she said she had the palest eyes that she's ever seen in her life was on uh, Jean Tierney. Just the, these beautiful, pale, colored eyes. So rest in peace. One of the top 10 most beautiful actresses of all time, Jean Tierney. Have you ever heard about a crime that happened where a murder was committed and you thought to yourself, well, why in the heck did that happen? Uh, whether you read it online, you were watching one of your favorite true crime YouTubers, or you were just watching a true crime television program. Well, enter one Stacy Barnett, 22 years of age, and her then 21-year-old boyfriend, 
John Goosey. So both of these kids had went to school at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, John was going to school and he ended up graduating with a bachelor's in English and history. His girlfriend, Stacy, she graduated with a bachelor's in architecture. They had been dating for about two years or so. Now, I don't know what John's issue was with being able to hold down work. Maybe he just didn't really want to work. You know, he just, uh, you know, committed a bunch of years at, you know, school. He, maybe he wanted to take a break. But one thing that Stacy knew about her boyfriend, John, that she did not like was the fact that he was, I guess, what you would call a mid-level marijuana distributor. Uh, I'm guessing this guy would probably buy, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 pounds of marijuana and he probably sold it by the pound or by the half pound to whoever they would buy it and then they would break it up and probably sell it into you know quarter ounces or dimes nickels whatever the whatever the hell people are doing nowadays so one of the marijuana dealers if you will that john was doing business with was a kid by the name of james thompson jr i believe at the time he might have been 20 21 years of age so he would sell him whatever amount of marijuana the guy wanted and he would go sell it so he would front james a half a pound right so one day he fronts him this half pound and james comes back to him and says oh hey man i got robbed i got robbed i'll pay you back man can you front me another half a pound so i can make some money and with that basically all the proceeds from that uh, half pound of marijuana will all go to you so i'm assuming that john felt that james was good for it so he fronts him yet another half a pound but the truth was that james was never robbed he was just a d-bag that's all he's just a thief now this guy owes he owes john about 8500 bucks now, I don't know if this John guy was a violent person or not. I don't know if he said, hey, where's my money? I want my money, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But James owes John $8,500 for two half pound parcels of marijuana that he was supposed to distribute or sell or whatever. He takes his cut and he pays him for the half pound of marijuana. That's how it normally works. So this guy, owes John $8,500 and he's sitting around one day and he's like, how am I supposed to pay this guy this money for the marijuana that I stole? Well, I guess there's only one option. I guess I gotta kill him. So he's sitting around with his two loser friends, Roy and Samuel. And he's like, well, we're gonna kill him. And Roy and Samuel, they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's kill him. I don't know what in the hell that James promised these two clowns to give them for committing a murder. But supposedly they're, they're, they're game. They're good to go. All right. So the only problem was John's girlfriend. So they live together. So James makes a declaration. I'm gonna call John, tell him I got your money, whatever nonsense he told him. But if his girlfriend's there, I'm gonna kill both of them. So Roy drops him off at the apartment complex or the condo where they lived. He goes upstairs, knocks on the door, goes in, immediately shoots and kills John. And then he goes to the other room and kills his girlfriend. He takes a, 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 a he, he has some ammonia in his bag. So he pours ammonia on their bodies to cover up any kind of whatever the hell. He probably was watching too much uh, true crime TV. And he takes their phones and smashes it with a hammer, thinking that they're not gonna be able to get any information. They're not gonna be able to uh, get the text messages from James going to John. So he kills them both. 
And, you know, next day they're discovered dead um, all over the news in Houston. So James is with his friend, one of his other friends, and he says, uh, as the murders are being played on television, he says, he says, hey, hey, I'm the one that did it. The one, what do you mean, the, the did what? I'm the one that killed those two people. Pretty proud of himself, right? Pretty proud of himself indeed. So his friend's like, oh, that's really awesome. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Uh, well, I got to get going now and whatever, whatever exit he makes, uh, he contacts the police and he says, Hey, this guy claims to have killed John and Stacy, the two kids that were murdered at the, uh, condo. And well, the police, they pick up James and, uh, he sings like a canary. Uh, this, this guy readily admits that he uh, committed the murders. Uh, he implicates his friends, uh, Royce Rennick and Samuel Gifford. Two guys, these two guys had nothing to do with James' debt. I don't know what in the hell they were thinking. I really don't know. But, uh, you know, they all planned it and Roy was the getaway driver. So they're all arrested. <laughs> And I guess Samuel didn't want to cooperate at first, but uh, Roy was like, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll cooperate. And all these guys are pretty young. You know, uh, you know, Roy is 22 and Samuel's 20. I still don't know why and God, like, what is this? Just one of, just a ridiculous, ridiculous crime. So eventually later on, James pleads guilty to capital murder. He's sentenced to life in prison. And uh, Roy Rennick and Samuel Gifford were each uh, sentenced to just a first-degree murder. Uh, Roy got uh, 35 years in prison, and Samuel, because he didn't want to take a deal, he ended up getting 50 years in prison. And uh, uh, this is the uh, final resting place of uh, John Goosey and Stacy uh, Barnett. And supposedly in the story, uh, the, uh, the manager or whoever of the condo complex had warned Stacy that her boyfriend was dealing with some, uh, nefarious characters, if you will. And I don't know, but a, a terrible story over $8,500 that this thieving bastard, James Thompson doesn't want to pay up so you know listen you you you're making money you're making good money you're making it fast and easy hey you're just buying and selling guys buying and selling and let me tell you now even though it is still illegal in texas to you know possess marijuana it's just funny how other states you know this kid could have just said you know what i'll move to california and and and, and get into the business but just because of some uh thieving bastard killed both of these kids very very tragic pretty fancy if I do say so myself my beloved giant sleeps Quite an interesting stone, very colorful. It says, I am part of all I've met. Okay, guys, uh, it is about that sad time where I have to end this video. They closed the gates here at five o'clock. And uh, I was standing around talking to the woman in the office. She doesn't work here. She uh, has her husband who's buried here. And 87 year old woman, she was a teacher. Her name was Tony. Uh, if you ever see this video, uh, hello. Um, 
very lovely conversation. Uh, we only talked for maybe 10 minutes and uh, it felt like we talked for an hour. I would have loved to have continued to, to speak with you. I invited her on the video, but she didn't want to. But I would have loved to have you guys hear her talk about her husband. They were married for 63 years. Um, he was a CPA here in Houston. And, uh, you know, 91 years old, passed away. And um, she said she loved uh, her husband as much as Jesus loves lost souls. So I invited her on. I said, you know, I gave her my phone number. I said, if you, you know, I'll be in Houston for uh, four or five days. If you uh, want to come on here and just talk. And she's like, well, what, I, what would I talk about? And I told her, I said, listen, you know, people love to just hear other people. I wish that I could invite people that I would see to come on my channel and just talk about whatever they know. But I don't ever run into too many people out here on the road. And she was just so lively. She reminded me of my grandmother. My grandmother, 91 years old, still as sharp as a tack. And uh, I wish I, I wish she would have said yeah, but anyways, she was very funny too. So I would have loved to have her, uh, you know, talk about uh, some of the graves and some of the of the known people that uh, she knows about that are buried in the cemetery. But who knows? Maybe one day she'll call me back. Maybe she'll be bored or something like that. Anyways, live but not live, but still alive by the grace of God. I am Lamont at large I'm at the Glenwood Cemetery here in Houston, Texas. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you hopefully on the next one. Have a good day, guys. God bless. Peace out.